Thing. Order! Oh, order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! But first, I'm thrilled to be joined by Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, Emily Thornbury. Lovely to see you. Hello, Robert. Emily. I've come all that far from your home. Um, since we're on the subject of Brexit, um, if I could just start by really putting to you this question, which lots of Labour MPs uh, and, and supporters put to me, which is, on issues like Syria, you've consulted the members on their views, Lots of Labour members are saying to me, why aren't they being consulted? Why haven't they got a voice when it comes to the Brexit policy? Oh, but they do. I mean, we have this national policy forum process. But there's where... no line which says in the policy... You know, you're, you're discussing all sorts of things that have, an imp have you know, Brexit sort of implications, but there's no particular debate on whether you should be in the customs union, whether, you should, whether, whether, whether you know, the UK should be in the single market, whether there should be a second vote. Well, we've got, a, we've got the National Policy Forum going on at the moment. Yeah. I was there yesterday. Um, Keir is there today. And this afternoon we have, I think, the longest session is going to be on Brexit. So there will be a debate in, in uh, the National Policy Forum at that point. I mean, like, unlike the Tories, but, we do consult our members when it comes to developing our policy. But there won't be a member's position f formulated at the Policy Forum on your Brexit policy, will there? Well... It's, a, it's an ongoing conversation that we have, you know, within the party. And, and it's, as, as, you, as you've said yourself, you know, Brexit kind of impacts all sorts of different areas of policy. Mm. So yesterday I was talking about, about, uh, about development and about the development goals, mm. and we were talking about how Brexit impacts on that. I mean, it, it comes up on, in all different types of facets. And this afternoon we're talking about, in particular, you know, our six tests on Brexit, mm. what it is that we want to achieve as a result of the Brexit negotiations, and we'll be asking the members for their collective knowledge and their collective experience to feed into that. As you well know, the overwhelming majority of Labour members and supporters would like the Labour Party to sign up to a policy of continued membership of the single market and the customs union. My sense is, particularly actually talking to John McDonnell last week about this, that you're well on the way to signing up to that approach? What we do is we, we accept the result of the referendum, we have to leave mm. the European Union. If we're leaving the European Union, then we have to negotiate an ongoing relationship of with course. the European Union. We want to have... We, it, it, we've looked at it and we cannot see a way forward when it comes to Northern Ireland or to, uh, to, to tariff-free trade mm. across Europe without us being in some form of customs union yeah. that probably looks we, very much like the customs like union. Like the current customs union. That's what John McDonald said uh, the, last week. And, that's, you know, and that's, a, that's our position on that. As for the single market, you know and I know that it's very difficult for us to remain in the single market as it currently is because... Nobody can pretend that the referendum didn't include a debate on immigration. And we want to have fair rules and manage migration when it comes to immigration. So we need to negotiate something. But if you could come up with something on what you call fair rules and manage migration that allowed effectively the UK to retain essentially the rights to the single market that Norway has, you, you would be in favour of that. What we want is we want to have a deal which is in accordance with the six tests which Keir laid out and which are in our manifesto and which all Labour MPs signed up to when they stood for election. We have to leave the European Union, but we have to have a deal which, which looks after jobs and looks after the economy first and foremost. Nobody voted to be poorer and nobody voted to lose their job. Well, Emily Thornbury told you, Robert, that Labour members got plenty of opportunities to talk about Brexit, but we have had a tweet in, top of the stack. Uh, this is Emily Thornbury. Hi, Emily. I'm a party member. I go to ward meetings canvassing, pretty tied into Labour. I absolutely do not feel there's been any opportunity for me to be heard regarding Brexit. So maybe you can talk about that in a second. Um, look, the... the, the, the as, as you know, one of our viewers has, has said a Labour member, he feels he's not being listened to mm -hmm. on Brexit. You presumably get this all the time from Labour supporters and members, that the yeah. problem with the policy is, you know, they, they were consulted on Syria. They're not yeah, they had a direct email from yeah. Syria. Um, You'd like I mean, to see the same. They don't necessarily draw that comparison. It would be wrong no. to say that. Um, but, yeah, I think lots of Labour members feel that they're not being asked their opinion on Brexit. They don't feel that they're, bit, they're being consulted. 
I, uh, I do get it all the time. It would be a lie to say anything else. And where do you think the party will and should end up in terms of a position on Brexit? Do, I mean, are you one, for example, who thinks that Labour should back a second vote? Oh, no, at the moment, I am not a second voter because I know I go out and I door knock every single yeah. week and the last thing the people where I live want is another election. Yeah. They've got election fatigue and they think we should get on with our jobs. And so I totally back the British public on that. Mm. Um, I don't think that there is, ap there is appetite for another election. I do. I hope, wh wh whether it is what I think will mm. happen or not, I, I, I can't really say. I hope that we go to a position of staying in the customs union, staying in the single market. Um, as Emily has said, recognising some of the issues about immigration, which I actually think that we can do in those, in, in those systems. Uh, and, and you think, because I imagine quite a lot of your constituents are worried about what, you know, free movement, as it were. You, 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 you... I think they are. It doesn't come across, actually, as much as you might imagine. And considering I live in a Leave constituency, but I also live in a Leave constituency with a huge amount of immigration, so actually they're less fearful about immigration because they are exposed to different sorts of people. And no doubt about it, there are some who are, you know, concerned. But actually, I think those concerns are much more about general immigration, not European immigration. It's not as nuanced as that, actually, is yeah. the reality. I'm joined now by Yvette Cooper, uh, Chair of the Home of Affairs Select Committee, a very busy woman these days. Very good morning to good you, Ms Cooper. Um, your committee has been pretty damning about the Home Office plans for, for EU citizen registration. Two systems that they want to put in place, uh, one for those already here, one for those who arrive after March 2019. You say it can't be done. We don't think they've got time now to get two different systems in place because there's just been so many delays. The immigration white paper's been delayed again. We haven't got the clarity about what these systems are going to do. And also not enough resources in terms of people in place and, you know, the delays with the IT systems and so on as well. So, look, that's our concern. If we don't have more details, more answers about how this system should work, then it is really difficult for the immigration staff, for the border staff, to actually get these things in place in practice. And if you can't get it working properly, it's a mess for everyone. But just, just to be clear, you're, you're, you're certainly not, in, as part of this, making a value judgment on the government's position of treating some EU citizens in one way and, and others, those who arrive after exit, in a different way. Well, we didn't look at the desirability of the policies. We thought we would just look at the practical implications. Can they deliver things in time? And the problem is, at the moment, different ministers are saying different things. So both the Brexit secretary and the Home Secretary have implied that there will be the same arrangements for those arriving after uh, Brexit day as those arriving before, those in the transition compared to those before, who, those who are here already and people who are here and working here. But then the Prime Minister has said, no, the arrangements are going to be completely different. And we still don't know which it is. We do understand some of this will only be finalised during the negotiations on the transition deal. However, we don't even know what the government intends to get out of the negotiations, what they're trying to get and what their objectives are. So we want them to tell us, we want them to set out exactly what they want the plans to be during the transition period and then to set out how it's going to be delivered and to put more resources into it. I mean, as you mentioned, that white paper on our post-Brexit immigration system has been a while in the making. I mean, what, what does that represent? Problems with, with, with designing such a system or do the problems in part perhaps stem from the indecision that we're seeing around the cabinet table? Well, it looks to me as though there is just a lack of agreement in the Cabinet and also a lack of decision. I understand why they're not setting out the long-term framework on immigration because we're all waiting for evidence from the Migration Advisory Committee, which is due in the autumn. But the short term, what happens this year, what happens next year, what happens the year after, they really have to tell us. And it's irresponsible, frankly, not to do so. It's uncertainty for EU citizens, uncertainty for, for employers, but also just makes life impossible for the staff who have to deliver things. I think they just keep kicking the can down the road because they can't decide what they think the, the objectives should be. And Parliament, as a result, having no opportunity to debate it and work out whether we're getting this right. But didn't we learn anything from the speeches from Theresa May from Boris Johnson this week? I mean, let's take Mr Johnson first. Mm. I mean, you've, you've said a, a number of things, uh, including, to be honest, given everything he said about the bus, I don't see why we're taking him seriously at all. And you also tweeted this, which is interesting. Uh, waffly, bumbling, empty speech confirms my view. Why on earth is anyone taking this man seriously? I mean, did you not learn anything from uh, Mr Johnson's speech? 
No, only that he's gone round and round in circles and not made any progress at all. And look, there's a, there's a sort of formal response, which is, where's the detail? You know, this long, we've only got 13 months left until Brexit Day, and we've still got no practical details. It's still just the same, frankly, waffly, vague stuff, and that is irresponsible. But there's another thing here, which is, I do think you should show respect for people in politics. There's lots of people I strongly disagree with, including the Prime Minister, who I show respect for. But the thing about Boris Johnson, Johnson. I just think he's a joke. He embarrasses us here and abroad and he makes things up for his own personal gain. And that's why I just don't think we should be taking him seriously at all. If the Prime Minister didn't take him seriously as well, actually the government might be in a better state. I mean, some people would suggest that there is a, a similar degree of waffle when it comes to Labour's own position on Brexit. I mean, should we, uh, should we be seeking membership of the single market? Should we retain our position in the customs union? I think the customs union is particularly important. So the Labour Party said that we should be in both the single market and the customs union during the transition. I think that's right. But I would go further on the what happens after the transition, because from manufacturing areas, if you care about manufacturing and distribution across this country, Yorkshire, the North and the Midlands, actually we need that customs union. The idea that you would impose customs checks on our manufacturers, I think, would cause big problems. So why, is so I hope... not, why is the leadership not being clear about it? Then? Well, I hope it will. I hope that that's something. And tens that... of thousands of people are writing to the party. Tens yeah. of thousands of members are writing to the party, asking for more. Uh, for more on the single market membership? Uh, I think I understand that the, the Shadow Cabinet, I think, are meeting tomorrow. I hope that this is exactly what they'll look at. I hope they will say, look, we need a customs union. And I think there's really strong support for this across Parliament as well. We're going to be holding a, a briefing that uh, Nikki Morgan, as Treasury Select Committee Chair, and I are going to be hosting on Wednesday for the CBI, uh, talking to MPs about what it means for constituencies across the country in terms of the customs union as well. As someone with, with, with such a long association with, with the Labour Party, I wonder what you made of events yesterday at the National Policy Forum, where we saw the chair of the NEC, in essence, manhandle someone away from the podium uh, because, despite a majority of the people in that room wanting the election of the, the chair of the, uh, the NPF, uh, the NEC decided against it. Well, I wasn't there. Um, but I was troubled by some of the reports uh, that we saw. I think, look, the, the Labour Party has always been a broad church and must continue to be so. We're also always a party that I believe would show respect for, for those who are chairing robust meetings, that should always make sure that every voice is heard, that we have proper processes for internal elections. And I think no one ever wants to see one faction try to silence others or for, uh, for things to be handled in the way that they appear to have been yesterday. So well, you use the word I think it's really there. important. I mean, do, you, do you see it as factionalism within the party? I think that that's, we, we don't want that. And the reason that we don't want any of that kind of kind of internal argy-bargy to end up uh, distorting what we do is because for all of us, our purpose is to stand up for people right across the country who want uh, a Labour government, who need the work that Jeremy Corbyn's been doing across the country to be taken forward, and we should be pulling together and, and making sure that we're standing up for people across the country and not just navel-gazing and looking in with ourselves. Uh, now, we, we, we spoke to your colleague John Healy about this just a few minutes ago, but I wanted to, to, to ask you as well. Um, uh, Brendan Cox and his, uh, his resignation from the charities he's represented, uh, what do you make of his decision? I mean, it's pretty clear he has admitted uh, to, 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 a serious, uh, to, a, to a serious amount of impropriety. Oh, well, I think, like John, I think that he has done the right thing, and I've seen his statement where he talks about taking responsibility and, and about the inappropriate behaviour. So I think that, yes, he has done the right thing. Look, there is a, a wider issue here, because obviously I don't know the, the detail in individual cases, there's a wider issue here that I think hopefully we are seeing a change now in the climate and in culture where people are recognising that, you know, those in, in positions of power should not abuse positions of power, those who end up becoming the victims of harassment should have support to speak out and there should be systems in place that allow this to be dealt with and sorted out and not allow things to just drag on and continue to cause real problems. We can uh, only hope, uh, Yvette Cooper, lovely to see you, thanks for coming Thank in. You.